What type of images come to mind when you see the word cyborg? Arnold Schwarzenegger in Terminator? The Borg from Star Trek The Next Generation? Is it of a grandfather and his pacemaker? Or a baby and her vaccine? In her talk, We Are All Cyborgs, anthropologist Amber Chase defines the cyborg as an organism to which exogenous components have been added for the purpose of adapting to a new environment. We'll return to Chase's talk, but first, let's take a look at what this definition looks like from the perspective of a modern park bench. In his article, Cyborgs Among Us, Micah White opens with the following statement. With Bluetooth headsets attached, iPods blocking the world, and tiny netbooks stashed near to hand, some of us are choosing to augment our bodies with wearable computers, becoming other than human. White goes on to say that there will ultimately be a battle clash between the us and the them. The us being people who choose to live in reality with meditative awareness, and the them being the cyborgs who prefer their pixelated realities over their natural states. Although a bit harsh in his dichotomy between humans and cyborgs, White does reveal the pervasive problems of social detachment, the lack of appreciation of nature in the real world, and the misconstruction of reality that can arise from simply being plugged into technology at all times. Clearly, the lack of empathy and respect for the earth are major problems of the 21st century. What White misses altogether is that there may not be such a clear separation between cyborgs and humans after all. If we think of technology as a tool, human beings, and some animals, have been using tools since prehistoric times, and these tools have helped us immensely. But is technology just another tool, like a hammer, a pair of shoes, or a set of eyeglasses? According to educator, philosopher, English professor, and communication theorist, Marshall McLuhan, the computer is the most extraordinary of man's technological, technological clothing. It is an extension of our central nervous system. Beside it, the wheel is a mere hula hoop. Since our advances in technology, and specifically the internet, have we not already morphed into a type of cyborg? If we indeed are entirely or partially created by our interaction with our environment and our adaptation to it, what kind of cyborgs are we? Donna Haraway, in her essay, A Manifesto for Cyborgs, describes a cyborg as a hybrid of organism and machine, the illegitimate offspring of militarism and patriarchal capitalism. Whereas White describes a battle between those who are natural and those who are cyborgs, Haraway states that there is no such differentiation. She illustrates this by pointing out that the natural state for women, in particular, has been defined as weak, submissive, and over-sentimental. Not abiding to this definition of a female natural state, Haraway goes on to say that as cyborgs, we have been altered throughout history and therefore can continue to alter ourselves and choose what type of state to exist in. This definition provides hope to not only the limited definition of female naturalness, but also the current masculinized state of the world. After studying Haraway's A Manifesto from Cyborgs, it is exactly this state of the world that Harry Kunzuru, from the article You Are Cyborg, says we can change. Basic assumptions suddenly come into question such as whether it's natural to have a society based on violence and the domination of one group by another. Maybe humans are biologically destined to fight wars and trash the environment. Maybe not. Haraway's statement that we're all cyborgs bring hope, not fear, to the reader as it empowers the audience, female and otherwise, by embracing the adaptations provided by technology as a way of reconstructing personal identity. Further, Amber Chase, in her TED Talk, We Are All Cyborgs, 
maintains that we've been adding parts to our bodies since we first decided to dive into the deep seas or float in astronaut suits above the Earth. As an anthropologist studying cyborgs, or us, Chase explains that we're growing with technology. She describes the online second self as an exogenous part of our bodies. She points out that our Facebook, Twitter, personal websites, or our another selves on the internet require varying amounts of attention. Further, just as our human bodies undergo a pubescence, Chase says that this is true for our cyborg second self as well. Quite often, when we first create our online persona, we may put up way too much information, or inappropriate photos, or type inconsiderate comments that everyone sees. When we go through these trials and tribulations and finally figure out how to manage this second self in a manner that suits us, we have passed this puberty stage of our cyborg self. Contrary to Mikhail White's argument that humans and human machines cannot peacefully, peacefully coexist for long because the frame through which the cyborg sees the world is one in which the mystery of existence has been programmatically obscured, Amber Chase studies explain that technology helps us become more human because it increases our ability to communicate with each other. Viewed in this light, the cyborg appears to be walking the line of the evolving Homo sapien. The question is, which way is she going?